So Ken and I have known each other for a little bit of a while because we both worked on Hubble at the same time back in the... Uh, back in the days of origin. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we were having a day. It's like, do I really want to say how long it's been? So he is still at Goddard and working still on Hubble and related to Hubble and also on the W first now Roman space telescope. So can you tell us a little bit? First of all, hi, Ken. It's really nice to see you. I'm so glad you could join us. Thank you. Good to be back. Wish I was out there in person, but this will do. I know. We could have a trip to Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> it was like Ken, uh, Ken is a big Disney fan, and I hadn't been to Disneyland in so long, and we went together, and we got there at quarter to seven in the morning, and we left after midnight. <laughs> and I, we had this intense day of seeing everything there is to see in Disneyland. It was wonderful. And we are getting too old for that. But, you know. <laughs> oh, it was so fun, though. We had so much fun. It was really great. So, Ken, we're so glad you're here. And please tell us, who is Nancy Roman? And and tell us a little bit about your telescope. Okay, so yeah, who was Dr. Nancy Grace Roman? First of all, she was a PhD scientist. She was the first woman on the astronomy faculty at the University of Chicago, and she has a whole slew of awards to her name. I'll just mention one here, so it's one of the, the more exceptional ones. Uh, she is a recipient of the NASA Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal which is a very rare honor indeed. Parts of the reasons that she was given that medal is that, and, and remember that this is back in the early 60s, is right after NASA was formed in the late 50s. She became the first chief of astronomy and solar physics at NASA and the first woman to hold an executive position at NASA. This is at a time where there weren't many opportunities and it wasn't very easy for females to get into the field. And she was both brilliant and strong-willed and just worked her way right up to the top very early on in NASA. NASA's history. And it wasn't just that she got those titles, but she was a real driving force behind the conception, design, and building of the orbiting astronomical observatories that did the, some of the first ultraviolet observations of the sky. The International Ultraviolet Explorer, which was a precursor to Hubble, much smaller telescope, only about 18 inches in diameter compared to Hubble's 2.4 meters in diameter, but uh, a real workhorse in astronomy that was designed for a three to five year lifetime and ended up lasting 18 years and made some of the most uh, astounding discoveries in ultraviolet astronomy ever. And if I can just butt in on that one because, and I promised you I would because IUE, the International Ultraviolet Explorer, was, was my telescope. That's what I cut my teeth on. That's what I got my PhD, all the data. And so I was at Goddard, as you know, the control room with it, literally the PDPs where you had to, to send a command, you had to flip the switches, like click, 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 and then send. And she was around Goddard at that time. So I did get to see her. And she was a force. She was a real inspiration to all of us, especially all of us young women. And she uh, went on. She didn't stop there. I mean, she, again, was the driving force between for just getting IUE built. But then there was Hubble, which took literally decades to get authorized and funded and designed. And she was there the whole time, just pushing behind the scenes and maybe sometimes not so behind the scenes to get it off the ground. She went on to also push for experiments uh, on Gemini, Apollo and Skylab in parallel with these uh, remote sensing observatories that we've heard so much of. Overall, she was instrumental in establishing a new era of space-based astronomical instrumentation and, and research that, you know, one wonders without her if we would have been 10 years behind in getting that kind of science done in addition and in parallel with the human spaceflight program, which was getting all the press in the early days. She was also, as Laura mentioned, a champion of women in astronomy and a really, really strong STEM advocate pushing for education in science, technology, and engineering fields. You saw this picture earlier. This is a shot of Nancy with a model of the orbiting astronomical observatory back in around 1962 or so. And then in 1972, she was out at Goddard for a while. And you see her here in a control room looking up the numbers. So that's Nancy. That's why we see the telescope named after her. And I think now we want to talk a little bit about the telescope and just very briefly what it will do. As Laura mentioned earlier, it's a Hubble-sized telescope. Its basic difference, well, the two basic differences, one is that it's designed to work primarily in the infrared light that's redder than what the eye sees, whereas Hubble works in the ultraviolet, bluer than the eye sees 
space and into the optical. So even though WFIRST is following Hubble, it's looking at a different wavelength regime, just like the Webb telescope and complements Hubble in that way. So we would hope that as we like to see Hubble flying alongside Webb, we'd like to see it flying along the Roman Space Telescope if we can last that long. The big difference other than the wavelength coverage is that it's designed to be a wide field of view. Instead of zooming in and looking in incredible detail at one object, Roman Space Telescope is designed to take a huge field of view that's a hundred times larger than what Hubble can see in a single image. So we can do these immense surveys of the infrared sky. A primary driver for this is to study dark energy and the accelerated expansion of the universe, which is the biggest puzzle in modern astrophysics. We'll also be studying the structure of galaxies and galaxies clusters, and we'll also be searching for exoplanets in a regime that TESS and the Kepler satellites have not been able to do before. So it's going to be a, a real workhorse, and it will be a nice complement to both Webb and Hubble. And to really bring home the importance of this wide field of view, I want to show you a short video which shows the Andromeda galaxy, which Hubble did a survey of about a third of it at full resolution and full color. It wasn't easy for Hubble. It took something on the order of 400 plus images to get that. W first, now the Roman telescope can do that in two images. So instead of taking a month to get this kind of survey of a nearby galaxy, Roman Space Telescope can literally do it in minutes, which and means it's, that it's at the same resolution of Hubble. The so, same resolution. It's just incredible. And that means not only can we do time studies of Andromeda here, instead of being able to do it only once, that means we can survey dozens of other galaxies very easily without spending an excessive amount of time. So this is going to generate huge amounts of data. And, you know, one question there is who will analyze all that data? So this is an opportunity for you youngins out there who might be interested in going into astronomy or astrophysics. There's going to be plenty of data for you. So sharpen your pencils or your keyboards or whatever and get ready to go. I did want to take you a little bit behind the scenes here to see Dr. Roman in a little more informal circumstances. Back in 2017, she came out, it was about a year before she passed, came out to Goddard Space Flight Center and did a tour of the Hubble Operations Center to kind of see what her efforts had wrought and went around with the Goddard. And I was asked as part of this tour to give her a little science briefing on what Hubble had done recently. And I tell you, it's uh, despite the fact I'd been with my PhD for a long time, I felt like I was doing my general exam all over again, trying to talk to her because she may have been on the elderly end of life, but her mind was as sharp as it was back in the 60s. And you could not just tell her, oh, well, we've got this detector and it's taking these gorgeous pictures. So, well, wait a minute. Don't just say that detector. Tell me how big are the pixels? How many of them are? What's, you know, and she would just go after you and, you know, to get down to the finest level of detail. So it was a lot of fun, but it was kind of scary. You know, you really didn't want to seem uh, like you didn't know what you were talking about in front of her. Fortunately, that went well. I think she enjoyed it. It. She also, I think, enjoyed talking to the various people that were around there. And this is just a, a small sampling of them. Nancy is in the center of this picture here. See here the center director, Chris Scalise, at the time of her visit. And to Nancy's left is John Mather, who is the only NASA Nobel laureate who got it for his work on the COBE mission and the uh, study of the background radiation. So it was a, a fun day for all of us. That's more of the operations people. I like this in here because Nancy's just kind of peeking over my shoulder there. This is Pat Krause, the, the Hubble operations manager. He runs the whole thing for us at Goddard. This is Nancy. Uh, Don't forget Olivia. I just have to shout uh, out to Olivia, who's the woman standing talking to because she was a classmate of mine in grad school and still works for Hubble and was also, as all of us of that era, were greatly influenced by Nancy Roman. And you, you both went to Wisconsin? Yeah. It was produced a, a huge slew of people, especially in the area of ultraviolet astronomy. Yeah, it was an just ultraviolet hub. Generated year after year, just really, really talented folks like both of you. Here's a picture showing that Nancy was still very active as late as 2017. She or she's getting set up to do a television interview in the back part of the Hubble Operations Center, which is to her back is where the actual control consoles are. And in the outer hallway, you can see some of the displays of returned equipment from the Hubble servicing missions. And then my favorite photo of this entire collection, this shows some of the women that she helped enable to get careers in the field. To her right, there are two uh, spacecraft engineers. To her left, 
uh, Olivia again on the science side, Dr. Patty Boyd, who was my deputy operations project scientist on Hubble at the time, and then Aaron Kusilik, who was the head of the Hubble outreach program. And this, to people who were around in the 60s and 70s, is an astounding picture to see that many women high up in an organization such as Hubble. And to a large degree, we have Nancy to thank for that. Yeah, I uh, she used to just be around Goddard all the time. And you know, anytime I went down there, you'd see her. And you'd see her way into her very senior years. She just was everywhere. <laughs> she was there. And, you know, when she, uh, I was there once when she uh, looked at Webb in the clean room. And it was the same thing there. You know, you give the usual tour that you gave everybody. But, you know, if she wanted it two or three levels deeper than that, it's like, I'm floundering, you know, trying to wave down a Webb person. Say, do you come here and talk, you know, <laughs> detectors or optics or whatever? <laughs> Do you know that we have a slide on that because we're going to finish up talking a little bit about web and we have that picture and I did not look closely and realize you might be in it. Well, I'm probably not in that one. I think she was there more than once, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, we will see. You know, first of all, the Roman telescope is going to be fantastic. Imagine a Hubble except a hundred times and the fact that the optics are optimized so that you get the resolution of Hubble, but a field this wide is, is really quite something. And it's had a, a quite a history. Uh, it's gone through its funding challenges and political challenges and so forth, but it, it looks like it's really gonna happen now. Is, would you agree? We think so. It was uh, the, the number one choice of the decadal survey. Every 10 years, NASA goes out to the National Science Foundation of National Research Council and says, okay, look at the field overall and figure out where we should put our resources for the coming 10 years. What's the most important thing for us to do? What's the second, third, fourth more important things to do? And try to give us a broad range of missions. Well, the last time we did that such a survey, the Roman Space Telescope came out as the highest priority for a large strategic mission. So that puts a lot of of weight behind it. And when we have funding issues from time to time, we point to that and said, you know, this is what your esteemed uh, committee, the best scientists in the world said we should do next. But you, you really know. don't hear about the way you hear about uh, the Webb Telescope. And I think also with the name Roman now, it's harder to cancel. Who could cancel Roman? Telescope <laughs> would be so bad. So last question, because I see Tony's ready to join us too. Come on in, Tony, and hang out for a moment while we make this transition. But launch date, What's when's it supposed to go? We are aiming for the mid 2020s. Uh, we haven't set an official launch day yet, you know, because we're still fair ways out. We're in the basically the design phase of the mission. We are procuring some long lead hardware, buying some detectors and testing them so we can select the best ones. But a lot of the construction of the telescope is uh, and its instruments are still, you know, still to happen. So we'll set the actual launch date closer than that. But we're hoping you know, 2025, 20, 2026. 20, uh, so a few years after Webb, but hopefully soon enough that Hubble will still be up there and we can get them operating in parallel and cover the entire sky from ultraviolet all the way out to infrared and maximize the information we can get uh, on the objects we're looking at. Fantastic. Thank you again. Uh, before I go, I'm going to screen share here because I had one more slide in my PowerPoint for the Nancy Roman one, and that is the ever important Lego character. <laughs> That's Nancy Roman. She, together with Lyman Spitzer, were the two that just carried the Hubble forward. So I think, you know, you know that you've reached a certain pinnacle when you get a Lego character. And then I, you know, just again, re-emphasizing the, the two fields of view are, I mean, the f comparative field of view. I just keep coming back to at the same resolution. And then here is that image you of the uh, video that you showed with all the green blocks coming in of how many images did it take? It's 430 images. Yeah, so here are 430 Hubble images uh, spliced together with the Hubble field of view and uh, that gave us that magnificent. And if you haven't, audience, haven't gone, to see, go check it out because you can zoom in and see every little star, it's insane. But anyway, it... it <laughs> It's going to be a fantastic telescope. So, And just in case, people always ask this question, if you're wondering why the field of view of the Roman Space Telescope looks so odd, it's because to get a very sharp focus over the entire field of view, you have to curve it like that. It's just the way the optics are, are designed. Yeah, we, have, we dealt with that with a whip pick. Why is it always that little triangle thing or three-piece three thing? So, you know, physics and engineering dominates. Got to do what's going to be best. 
So I had a couple more pictures of that, but we're going to move on to that other telescope. I, to, for those of you who work on Roman, is this the telescope that shall not be named? Or, <laughs> or is it a, you know, a happy collaboration? Well, we love all our telescopes. You know, we, we do wish it would get off the ground so we could go full speed. But, you know, we have to be patient because none of these huge efforts like this, uh, you know, go up quickly. It, it took a couple of years, you know, decades from conception to, to actual launch and we were uh, yeah. delayed a couple times ourselves, but yeah. you know, it's, they all are designed to complement each other. So we we just you know having another very capable instrument in the sky is just something we can all get excited about. 